Well, good morning, Sobel Church. It's good to be with you today. Even though we're not together in the same room, we're together in spirit. Isn't it great that church in today's world isn't about buildings? It's about us being together in unity and under the name of Christ through his spirit. So Sharon and I just bring greetings from Water's Edge. Thank you for your support. Continue to pray for us. And uh, God is watching over us. He will provide. We're celebrating today what's called Palm Sunday, which is a very interesting celebration, especially in hindsight that we know they didn't really get what was going on. They, uh, They were celebrating what they were hoping would become an earthly king, somebody that would dethrone the Romans and allow the Jews to be free and and to reign in their promised land. And and yet God wept over Jerusalem. God was quite sad. Jesus came not just to save the Jewish people and and to establish their kingdom, but to save all of us. Praise God for that in hindsight. The problem that we do face heading into Easter before Jesus actually died for us is the problem of sin. And uh, the wages of sin is death, as we've heard in the scriptures. And then there's the gift of God, which is eternal life. Today I'd like to focus a bit on what's leading up to Easter before God's gift saved us and to deal directly with with the sin problem. Before I dive into that, I just want to make note of uh, our compassion for you as a church with all that's going on, not just the virus and not even just the construction that you're enduring and patiently uh, walking through. But we're very aware that David and Lisa are are struggling right now and and going through quite a bit as a family. And we, along with you, hold them up. And we hold them up to God, who is the great healer. And he is watching over them, and he's doing what God does best uh, to mend their broken hearts. So uh, bless you as a church as you bless them. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this celebration. Uh, Hosanna. Lord, save us has changed to praise you, God, for saving us. And Lord, even though we know Palm Sunday uh, wasn't as accurate as it should have been, you still rode into that parade, that triumphal procession. But you rode humbly on a donkey. And Lord, you did that and endured the next week and, and even the crucifixion, death and burial and resurrection. Lord, you did that for us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, Easter brings about God's gift. But there's a reason why we needed God's gift, and that's because of sin. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. It's good to know what we're battling against when we're battling something. Sin is very much like a great and deadly virus. And uh, we need an antidote. We needed Jesus Christ to die for us and pay that penalty in full to heal us. From sin. I have a question for you. How many sins does it take for you not to be permitted into God's heaven? For you not to be able to be in God's presence? And if you answered one sin, you're correct. But if you answered no sins, you're also correct. The reality is that with Adam and Eve, it was one sin. They were doing very well in communion with God, walking together in the garden until they sinned, and that divided them. For us, we've grown up in sin. The DNA handed down to us means we're born in sin, and the wages of sin is death, and the separation from God is because of that. So it doesn't matter. We don't have any sins, and we're already separate from God, and we need help to get together. Let me define for you uh, what sin is according to the Bible. In Christian views, it is an evil human act which violates the rational nature of man as well as God's nature and his eternal law. According to the classical definition of St. Augustine, sin is a word, a deed, or a desire in opposition to the eternal law of God. For kids, we say anything that hurts God. James 4 says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. There's an interesting analogy or, or assimilation in, in, throughout the entire Bible in, that gives us a really good picture of, of what sin actually is. And it starts way back in Leviticus and Numbers uh, in the area of skin diseases, believe it or not. For those of us that are reading through the scriptures and we, we slugged our way through Leviticus and Numbers, there was chapters designated just to skin disease, diseases. 
and how the priests were to know the difference and understand what was temporary and healable and what was a real problem on the inside. Even before that, God used Moses to prove that he was God and that he was going to set the, the Hebrews free by putting his hand in his cloak, taking his hand out of the cloak, and it was covered in leprosy, a skin disease, and then back in and healed again. Naaman, as we know that story, dipped into the, the disgusting river that was polluted and came out free from his leprosy. Moving into the New Testament, we know that Jesus was often acquainted with lepers and healing them. And even later on, when he sent out his disciples, his commands were to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse those who have skin diseases or leprosy. And the reality is, leprosy is a good demonstration of what sin actually is. You see, leprosy is a systemic issue, a systemic disease that comes from the inside and presents itself on the outside with uh, the destruction of, of skin. Sin is very much that way. It starts on the inside in our heart, and we see on the outside the actions and the results to that as we try to solve the problem on our own. Jesus addressed this very clearly in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked to the people about their hearts. He said that if you hated your brother, it was the same as murder. And what he was talking about is it, it all stems from the same place. It's in our heart. And whether it comes out as just hatred or continues and spirals into murder, it's still the same problem at the base. It's a sin. James 4 again says, we do what we do because we want what we want. We want to blame other people, but we can't. Sin causes us to blame, and it causes us to hide, and it's a real problem. What I want to talk to you about today is I'm going to give you a picture of where sin comes from. And it starts with two foundations that are very, very problematic in our lives. Now, I know some of you are going to be distracted. I know Andy and, and probably Dave Boys, and I know Phil Reed for sure are looking at this, uh, this white gold thinking they want some, but... I'm just borrowing this from the church. I'm going to give it back. I promise you. So here we go. Problem number one at the very root of sin is pride. See, we have all kinds of issues up here that we could name, and it's almost uh, endless, the amount of ways that pride will manifest itself in our life. But at the very root, you can't go any lower than pride. And what is pride? Pride is me saying, God, you're not doing a good enough job. I'm going to go past you and look for something else that suits what I need. And pride becomes a real problem because if that's at the base of our life, when we start to build it, we run into problems. We run into things like arrogance, like a desire to have self-sufficiency, greed, frustration, anger, malice, murder. It leads to death. A life built on pride is very crooked and very unstable, and it's not where we want to be in our life. But there's also another foundation behind sin that you can't go any lower than, and that is fear. And what is fear? Fear is me saying, God, you're not doing a good job. I want to go past you and find something that's better suited to my needs. Did you notice that it's the same? Fear and pride is the same. And with fear, we start to build a life on top of that that causes us maybe to be shutting down, have regret, focus on ourselves. We have sadness, anxiety, depression. Fear is a terrible foundation, and it causes us to fall. Because you can't build a life on pride and on fear. It's a terrible place to be. And I'm talking to everybody. Some people think, hey, I'm a Christian. I don't have to deal with sin anymore. But that's not necessarily true. As long as we're on earth, sin is around us. And we need to battle this. What does sin do to us when it's built on pride and on fear? It makes us want to solve the problem ourselves. Let me give you an example of sin and how it works in our lives. By telling you a story about the Eskimo wolf hunters. According to tradition, this is how an Eskimo hunter kills a wolf. First, the Eskimo coats his knife blade with animal blood and allows it to freeze. 
He then adds layer after layer of blood until the blade is completely concealed by the frozen blood. Next, the hunter fixes his knife in the ground with the blade up. When a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source of the scent and discovers the bait, he licks it, tasting the fresh, frozen blood. He begins to lick faster, more and more vigorously, lapping the blade until the keen edge is bare. Feverishly, now harder and harder, the wolf licks the blade in the cold Arctic night. His craving for blood becomes so great that the wolf does not notice the razor-sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue. Nor does he recognize the instant when his insatiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. His carnivorous appetite continues to crave more until in the morning light the wolf is found dead on the snow. Many people reach for temporary solutions to try to heal the hurts in their heart. They try to dull the pain by engaging in various acts, whether it's substance abuse or anger or sexual uh, mis misuse. For the same reason that the wolf begins licking the knife blade, it seems safe and delicious at first, but it doesn't satisfy. More and more is desired, leading to a crisis or death. Don't be fooled by the temptations of sin. Like the wolf, we can get away with it for a while. Eventually, however, its true character is revealed. Sin leads to death and destruction. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 We need a solution. We need to be saved from sin. We need to be freed from pride and from fear. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. You know what the opposite of pride is? Because if we want to be healed, we want the opposite. We don't want to be close. We don't want to be just near it. We want to be running the opposite direction. The opposite of pride is humility, humble trust in God. The real world is, is it's faith. Faith in God is the opposite of pride. We can't humble ourselves before all-knowing, all-creator God and still have pride in our heart. So it starts with dealing with pride. You know what pride is? It's C.S. Lewis says it like this. It's taking a telescope and looking through it backwards where it magnifies ourself and shrinks the heavens. And we need to do the opposite. We need to put God first and to raise him up and to shrink ourselves. When you build a life not on pride but on humble faith in God, you start to build strength. It gives you peace with God. It gives you confidence. It leads towards serving others and not just yourself. It gives you joy. It gives you life. And it's stable and it's strong. This is what the Lord says, Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you built for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things and so they came into being? declares the Lord, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. Let's hear that again. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. You know, God is everywhere. He notices everything. There's one thing that grabs God's attention. There's one thing that says to all the angels, come, come to the cherubim and to Michael and Gabriel, come and look and he'll look over the edge down on earth and he'll look at you when you're humble and with a contrite spirit. Isn't that beautiful? A God who knows everything is still surprised, is still attracted when we humble ourselves before him and he raises us up. As I said, there's fear on the other side and we need to be healed from fear, which is ultimately the same as pride where we don't think God is doing a good enough job. When we turn fear around and we go the opposite direction, it's not courage. Courage and fear can coexist. What it is, is love. Perfect love casts out all fear. And when you deal with fear and you start to grow a life on top of love and not fear, it frees you up to have actions of love and care for other people. You have intimacy with each other and with God. You have peace. You have life. And you have a strong and stable life. Praise God for that.
Colossians 3, 5 to 6 says this. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Sin is very much like gravity, constantly pulling down on us. Let's talk to the Christians. There's times where we believe we have to redeem ourselves. Jesus paid it all. When we have to redeem ourselves, we start to think that I have to earn God's love. And I start getting a little cranky and a little tired and a little frustrated. And that's not the case. When we became Christians, when we received God in our heart, when we humbled ourselves before him, he paid the price. We are free. And it's our choice now to live free. Humbling ourselves is up to us. God showers us with his love. And as we focus on that and we think upon the appropriate things, we start to do the Christian disciplines out of love and compassion for God and for others, not to earn his attention or his love. He loves you. Remember what Jesus said, there will be troubles in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let these verses, let these words soak into your soul today. So what happened after Palm Sunday? Jesus was attacked that whole week by the religious leaders and eventually killed by them. It didn't go well. Under false testimony, the king of kings forgave. He forgave them because he was saving the whole world through his loving act, even the people that put him on that cross. He said this to all of us, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Christ died for us. Praise God for that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but of eternal life. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Palm Sunday, where you willingly walked into that city knowing that a week later you would be on a cross. And you did that willingly for us. So today, looking back, we do shout, Hosanna, Lord, you are the Savior, and you've saved us from our sin. Lord, I am sorry for my sins when I've looked past you, when I've tried to find alternatives to your saving grace, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We bow our knees to you today in pure adoration. In Jesus' name, amen.